Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak at this workshop. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, such as life with small children. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about a paper that I wrote about a year ago in collaboration with um, Omori and uh, Tom Rodelius. Um, and I think this uh, this paper might fit with the theme of this workshop. We'll see there's some interesting interplay between generalized symmetry and um, and uh, kind of swamplandy or weak gravity like conjectures. Okay, so um, may, by now everybody knows there's this big program of trying to constrain uh, what are consistent theories that can be coupled to quantum gravity. And uh, you know one one of the more uh, famous consistency conditions, which is almost a theorem now, is the idea that there's no global symmetry. This is inconsistent with the Hawking process for black holes, plus the absence of, of remnants and entropy arguments. So that's kind of an old point of view on it, um, with uh, recent updates by Banks and Seiberg and uh, uh, ideas in holography by Harlow and Oguri. Uh, and then you can ask more explicitly, what kind of amplitudes do we know of that might break uh, might break a global symmetry in quantum gravity. And here there's been some, some progress um, thinking about uh, wormhole geometries. So in the Euclidean gravitational path integral, uh, these, uh, these, are, um, these might give you saddles that uh, give you symmetry violating processes. And uh, again, this is starting to make this idea of no global symmetry uh, more quantitative. Now, of course, these kind of symmetry violating amplitudes, at least in the regime where they are semi-classically accessible, they're suppressed exponentially by the Euclidean action of a weakly curved uh, geometry. And so, uh, so they would be small, some exponential suppression. And so uh, one question, a uh, kind of provocative question I'd like to begin this discussion with is asking, are these the only symmetry breaking processes necessary for consistency? So, uh, you know, maybe more slightly more quantitatively, can a global symmetry be violated only uh, by exponentially small effects in effective field theory at the Planck scale? Is that a consistent theory coupled to quantum gravity? Um, or, or do we need stronger symmetry violation? So uh, a stronger conjecture that you might make, but and we'll uh, explore today, um, again, this conjecture could be wrong, and it might need additional assumptions, which I hope... Uh, but many of you will help figure out is that maybe um, all approximate global symmetries in low energy effective field theory consistently coupled to quantum gravity, maybe they're badly broken by the Planck scale. So th these exponential corrections from wormhole geometries or semi-classical geometries are not enough. So what, what would that mean a little more technically? It would mean that uh, there should be a symmetry violating operator in the Lagrangian with an order one coefficient in Planck units. Maybe it's a very irrelevant operator, but it should be there at the Planck scale. And our, our basic goal in this talk and in this, in this uh, work that I referenced at the beginning was to try to quantify this idea, try to make it a little sharper, and to explore its potential connection to other things that people have talked about um, in the past. So I won't prove this conjecture, but I'll show you how some parts of it are related to other conjectures for which there is some evidence. Okay, so, so the focus um, we'll see will be on the weak gravity conjecture. And this is a related conjecture, but it's not initially obvious why it is related, but we'll get there. But this is at least a conjecture that contains an explicit scale. And uh, really we're all, this, this talk is all about symmetry violating scales. So uh, give, what is the conjecture state? It's very famous by now. It says, given an effective field theory with a dynamical, U1 gauge field, there must exist a charged particle with mass M and integral charge N obeying this inequality here. Uh, where there's some order one numbers that maybe you don't need to take too seriously, but uh, th think about the parametrics of this inequality for now. And uh, by now there is extensive evidence for this conjecture in examples in string theory. So regardless of its initial motivation, the the huge list of, uh, of evidences make us take it seriously. Now, uh, to begin, let, let's try to formulate the weak gravity conjecture 
a little bit more intrinsically. Uh, it makes at least me a little bit uncomfortable to be sort of talking about gauge fields and uh, gauge charges and things like that. I'd like to work with the gauge invariant formulation of this conjecture. And to do that, it's useful to use notions of higher symmetry. Um, so there's this, uh, this, this big field now of higher form global symmetry. And uh, what do we need to know for this talk? We don't need to know that much. We need to know that a P form global symmetry is a kind of symmetry where the charged operators are P dimensional uh, defects. So zero form uh, is ordinary symmetry with charged point operators. And uh, for us, we'll focus mostly on one form symmetry, which has charged lines. And uh, we can talk about what's a conserved current for a one form symmetry. Well, it's a two form, J with two indices, which is anti-symmetric and conserved. And the same kind of arguments that you, uh, that we used to forbid, to, to reason that there should be uh, no ordinary global symmetries in uh, quantum gravity also suggest that there should be no exact higher form symmetries in quantum gravity. And the same kind of, of, uh, of uh, wormhole type solutions, uh, for instance, the Euclidean riser Nordstrom black hole will give you some exponentially suppressed corrections that violate one form symmetry. Now, the basic example of the theory of the one form symmetry is U1 electromagnetism. And in this theory, there are two distinct one form symmetries. There's the electric symmetry, which measures the charges of the Wilson lines. The current here is uh, J mu nu is F mu nu. It's conserved because I'm here talking for the moment about free electromagnetism, so no matter for the moment. And the fact that the Wilson lines are charged, this is a very fancy, uh, kind of the fanciest way of saying Gauss's law, which is that you just surround a test charge by a sphere and you do the integral of the electric field and you get the enclosed charge Q. Now there's a magnetic counterpart of Gauss's law. Uh, we can integrate the Hodge star of F. So we can track F with, with epsilon and integrate this J. That's also conserved by the Bianchi identity. Um, and it measures the kind of source magnetic charges in the problem. Now, so pure electromagnetism has these two exact one form symmetries. And if we believe the previous discussion about uh, uh, no exact ordinary or higher form symmetry in quantum gravity, then, then uh, we would conclude that pure electromagnetism coupled to quantum gravity is somehow a little bit inconsistent. We need some symmetry violation. So there must be effects violating these one form symmetries. So for ordinary symmetries, it's easy to break a symmetry. You just add an operator to the Lagrangian. Um, and the, if the operator is charged, it breaks the, it breaks the uh, symmetry in question. Um, but how are higher form symmetries broken in quantum field theory? Uh, well, here there's a new effect. And the new effect comes about because uh, sort of by definition, there are no local charged operators under a one form symmetry. So there's no per perturbation that you can add to the action to violate the one-form symmetry. Uh, so uh, let, let's just give an example of that to, so that you see it's a bit concrete. So you know, imagine you take pure Maxwell theory and you add to the uh, you add to the Lagrangian the leading higher derivative correction, say the the Euler Heisenberg term with some cutoff lambda. And okay, we we reanalyze the symmetries of this problem. Well, well, the Bianchi identity still definitely holds. So we still have this conserved magnetic current, this thing with two indices. And we can also work out the equation of motion. So the presence of this term modifies the equations of motion, but the equation of motion can still be written as the conservation of something. Now it's F plus this correction term. So we can still think of that as defining an electric conserved current. It got a little bit modified by the higher derivative correction, but the counting of symmetries is the same. So adding, adding operators can't break the symmetry. Instead, the natural mechanism to break one form symmetry is with charged matter fields by a screening effect. So again, going back to Gauss's law, 
we look at the integral of uh, star f over uh, two sphere, and that gives us this electric charge Q. That's Gauss's law. And uh, without dynamical matter, what I was talking about before, this integral is independent of this radius R. And that's the statement of the one form symmetry, that the, the answer doesn't depend on the radius. Um, a little more formally in a, in a modern language, that's the statement that this, this higher form charge is topological. It doesn't depend on the shape of the Gaussian surface. Now, once we actually have mobile charges in the game, so dynamical charged fields, not just pure Maxwell theory again, then there are screening effects and Gauss's law no longer exactly holds. So again, we'll have this Wilson line uh, in the game. We put it, say, at the origin with charge Q. That's this green charge here at the center. But um, now, because the vacuum contains virtual pairs, these pairs kind of uh, uh, arrange themselves to screen this charge. And uh, so what that means is that equivalently, we can think that this effective charge of the, this source that we introduce, it now depends on the radius. So previously, when we exactly had the symmetry, the charge did not depend on the radius. But now the charge depends on the radius. So we're going to have some charge Q, which depends on R. And quantifying that is a sort of standard problem in, in field theory, where uh, we use the uh, effective potential, uh, the so-called Ulling potential. Um, so let me write the formula for it. We'll be interested in the behavior of this effective charge um, as, a, as a function of uh, position. I'll normalize it out by the long distance value of the charge, that's Q at infinity. And I'm looking in the limit of small mr. So this variable is taken to be small. And I'm doing a weak coupling expansion here. OK, so there's a constant. Um, then there's this log correction. That's the very interesting piece. The log correction depends on n, which is the charge of the dynamical field in the problem. Uh, and then there are some corrections that I'll ignore for now. And we want to quantify. Uh, sort of the symmetry breaking scale of the one form symmetry, the, the, the scale lambda, where we no longer even approximately have the symmetry. So we, we'll, we'll do it this way. We'll say that the symmetry breaking scale lambda is defined where this position dependence in, in logarithmic variables of this effective charge Q of R uh, becomes, order, uh, becomes order one. So this is a formula that you can think defines a scale, or at least approximately, param uh, parametrically defines a scale. And we'd like to understand this scale. It's the scale of symmetry breaking, in this case, of the one form symmetry. Now, of course, you could try to do uh, a similar thing for ordinary symmetry. If you perturbed a Lagrangian by a symmetry violating operator, the, the scale lambda that you would define this way is just the, cu the, the kind of, um, the cutoff suppressing the symmetry, the symmetry violating operator. So th this agrees with sort of standard intuition. It's just that I'm doing it for one form symmetry. Okay, so what's the basic conjecture? I mean, I said I said something about this stronger potential conjecture that uh, that symmetry violation uh, that symmetries are violated by the time we reach the Planck scale. And in the case, if we apply it to the one form symmetry it would say the following. The symmetry breaking scale lambda is less than or equal to M Planck. So we can't have a model where parametrically the symmetry is very good at M Planck. Um, now, there's an interesting technical point here. Why am I concentrating on the logarithmic derivatives? I mean, going back here, I see I define this as uh, kind of stripping off the coefficient of the log and investigating that. Uh, why do that? Well. I'm trying to I'm trying to define something that is universal. So what what are we doing here? We're probing the short distance behavior of this effective charge Q of R. Um, and, and this is equivalent to extrapolating this current operator to scales uh, where it is not conserved anymore. So the current, remember, is something that was defined in the low energy effective field theory. This is an approximate symmetry. So at long distances, I'm not confused about what J is. It's the conserved charge. It's the conserved current. 
but I'm interested in extrapolating it to shorter distance scales and trying to understand its behavior. Uh, and you might worry that is this a is this really a kind of uh, a well posed problem? Well, if you modify the current, for instance, by adding an operator divided by a cutoff to some power to make something of the right dimension, this will lead to a power law modification of this effective charge Q of R. And so by focusing on the logarithm, I'm trying to extract um, this uh, kind of universal robust piece of the symmetry violation. So I'm asking when do the logs become so big in the position dependence of the effective charge that they themselves violate the symmetry. Okay, so why should you believe this conjecture about, weak, uh, about symmetry breaking scales? Well, uh, you know, for one form symmetry, this is equivalent to, uh, to uh, something called the tower weak gravity conjecture. So let's just go, uh, go through that a little bit slowly. So we consider a spectrum of charged particles. We have masses Mi and uh, charges Ni. So previously I was discussing a single particle of charge, uh, of charge Ni, uh, of charge N, but now I'll have, uh, I imagine, a spectrum of them. And I'd like to understand how does this um, uh, how does this uh, depend? How does Q depend on R? Well, okay, I have this formula. I, I wrote it before, so now I have just a sum. One small comment is that, of course, in effective field theory, I only take into account those particles um, which are still mobile at the scale R that I'm talking about. So in this sum, I don't sum over all particles, but just over those that haven't been integrated out yet. And an interesting uh, feature that you can uh, find by manipulating this right-hand side is that if the right-hand side is order one, by the time you reach the gravitational cutoff, then the average particle in my, in my set here obeys the weak gravity conjecture. So these angle brackets here mean the average of the charges over all the charges, and this, uh, this M means the average of the masses. So, uh, you know, I, previously I, I said this kind of uh, wild conjecture that maybe um, uh, maybe symmetry is broken badly at the Planck scale uh, in effective field theory, and at least uh, within uh, for one form symmetry, uh, when you investigate it in, in this context, this is just equivalent to the weak gravity conjecture. So the weak gravity conjecture can be rephrased as a statement about symmetry breaking scales of the one form symmetry. And that's a nice intrinsic way to say what that conjecture is really about. Okay, now once we have that point of view, we can say, aha, well, I know all sorts of other one form symmetries or other kinds of higher form symmetries. Maybe other of these uh, other swampland conjectures, the consistency conditions that people believe on quantum gravity, maybe they're actually also about symmetry violating scales. And that, uh, that turns out to be a useful, uh, useful point of view to organize these, uh, these consistency conditions, these proposed consistency conditions. So let me talk about another one, which is the magnetic weak gravity conjecture. So uh, electromagnetic duality applied to the ordinary weak gravity conjecture uh, would imply uh, something called the magnetic weak gravity conjecture, which says, um, here I've written it for a charge one magnetic monopole. It says uh, the magnetic coupling, E mag, which is one over the electric coupling, divided out by the monopole mass, this should be greater than or equal to one over M Planck. Okay, let's try to make it a little more concrete by thinking about a model where we have actual dynamical monopoles. So we have, we'll embed our U1 gauge theory inside a non-abuing gauge theory, which arises by Higgsing some adjoint scalar. So phi here will be an adjoint scalar. And then we'll have actually two polycup monopoles in the spectrum. We could try to ask, what does this conjecture, this conjecture mean about, um, about the parameters of that kind of model? And okay, so, so there are the various, uh, th these various um, uh, scales in the game here. So there's, a, there's the W boson, MW, which has mass E times sigma. And sigma here is the VEV of phi. And at weak coupling, E times sigma is much less than sigma. And then there's the monopole mass, which is sigma over E. So um, in this problem, if we embed a U1 gauge theory 
inside a non-abelian gauge, so you could think SU2. You have this hierarchy of scales to discuss. And what is the, what is the statement about these scales? Um, so you could look at uh, the, you could just plug in up here, you find that what you're learning is that MW, which is E times sigma, is less than or equal to E times M Planck. So now I've restored the standard electric coupling as opposed to the magnetic coupling up here. Now, of course, MW also sets the cutoff uh, for the uh, uh, abelian gauge theory description. So sometimes people say that the magnetic weak gravity conjecture is a constraint on the cutoff, um, that the cutoff is not just below M Planck, but it's below E times M Planck. And um, that gave a way to motivate the, the weak gravity conjecture uh, by relating it to, um, to ordinary, the, the constraint on ordinary symmetries by sending E to zero. So here we're instead taking a, a little bit of a different point of view where we're going to try to think about the magnetic weak gravity conjecture using the magnetic one form symmetry of the U1 gauge theory. Okay, so, so how will I think about this? So I'll have a UV operator, uh, J, and J, this is a well-defined gauge invariant operator. It's E over sigma, some number, times trace by F. Now, what's special about this operator? So this is a well-defined operator in, say, a non-abelian gauge theory. But when I Higgs, when phi develops a VEF, this flows to the magnetic current. So this is the operator which at long distances becomes the U1 mag one form magnetic current. And what we'd like to understand is, is kind of the, the symmetry breaking scale for that operator. So we'd like to compute that what's the cal calculation? We'd like to compute the effective charge of a UV line operator that approximates the infrared Tuft line. So what will that operator be? So it will be this expression, T of gamma Q infinity. Q, Q is the long range charge measured in the U1 uh, effective field theory. And it's given by the following. So you integrate this star of trace phi F the sum of overall factors over H. What's H? So we're trying to define a line operator. H is a half space with boundary this line. So um, you could think that this is, in long distances, this is like integrating um, uh, star of um, uh, star of the, of the IR field strength over this half space. And so by integration by parts, that defines a, a Tuft line on, right? So I'm in the same way that you can define a Wilson line by integrating F over a half space. You also define a Tuft line by integrating star F over a half space. And that's what's happening in this formula. So this is, this is a uh, well-defined UV line operator that approximates the infrared Tuft line. And Q of infinity, this number, is the magnetic charge uh, seen by the infrared observer. Okay, now what we want to understand is what is the effective charge? What's Q of, uh, of R? Uh, well, that's defined by an operator product expansion where we try to measure the one form charge of this Tuft line. So it gives us uh, this symmetry generator, gives us a phase, that's the effective charge, and then there's other things that I'm ignoring. So that's the definition of the effective charge Q of R. It looks a little bit like a bear uh, to compute Q of R, but at least at weak coupling, um, so if E is small, weakly coupled non-abelian gauge theory, and we Higgs in a regime where it's all weakly coupled, uh, then uh, you can compute this Q of R, this effective position dependent charge from an integral of the two point function. So uh, this is the expression that you would get. Q of R is, so now we're sort of in business. You see, it looks a little bit standard. I, I have uh, this operator trace phi F. I need to compute its two point function. And then I need to integrate that two point function over some regions. One is a half space and the other is a two sphere of some radius R. And the answer depends on R in some way. And that defines Q of R. So we're in the regime of small e here. So the, the two-point function of this non-abelian field strength in itself, that part's easy, and that actually looks like a higher form current. But the, the interesting part is that when, when phi, the Higgs field, fluctuates, we find violations. And this leads to uh, a simple formula that you can, you can work out by just plugging in the two-point function and turning the crank, that the derivative 
of uh, Q of R with respect to log R goes like one over R squared times sigma squared. So the scale where this, uh, where this symmetry violation becomes, log, uh, becomes in, in logarithmic units order one, that's the scale uh, of uh, sigma. So this, this symmetry violation scale, lambda, is equal to sigma in this problem. And so the, the conjecture that symmetry violating scales are less than m Planck would just tell you that uh, lambda is less than m Planck, and that would tell you sigma is less than m Planck, and that's exactly the magnetic weak gravity conjecture. So we have here kind of a point of view that, um, that is unifying the electric and magnetic weak gravity conjectures. Uh, namely, they're both about uh, symmetry violation, uh, symmetry violating scales uh, of one form symmetry in different problems. Okay, so let me let me tell you uh, briefly about um, uh, some make some comments and uh, and uh, then we'll um, I'll conclude. So so uh, of course the, the violation of one form symmetry is is equivalent to the endability of line operators. And this implies the existence of charges. This is very uh, similar to uh, a point of view on the weak gravity conjecture advocated by Harlow. Uh, but here we're focused on the symmetry breaking scale. And we've seen that saying that the scale is less than or equal to M Planck gives us a unified perspective on these, uh, on, on these conjectures, at least the two that I've mentioned. Now, of course, the paper has more. It's a half hour talk, so I can't uh, tell you all of it. But let me tell you two generalizations. The first you might want to know about is, well, you, you focus so much on, on U1 gauge theory. What about non-abelian gauge theory? Do we learn something about non-abelian gauge theory? And uh, here you have to come to the state of the art of symmetry to, uh, to try and understand if there's a symmetry formulation of the non-abelian weak gravity conjecture. And the point is that at weak coupling, non-abelian gauge theory actually has a kind of novel, non-invertible, uh, continuous one-form symmetry. I gather that Ibu gave a talk about uh, non-invertible uh, symmetry uh, earlier in the week. So maybe you have some idea what non-invertible symmetry is. Uh, but anyway, non-abelian gauge theory in the limit of weak coupling ha has a kind of uh, interesting symmetry. Uh, okay, why is it non-invertible? It's non-invertible because uh, even in the limit of, of weak coupling, you still have to do the gauge quotient. And if you demand that this uh, this symmetry in weakly coupled gauge theory is uh, badly violated, that is violated at a scale that's parametrically less than the Planck scale, uh, that, then that gives this uh, a tower of, of now non-abelian charges, which obey the weak gravity conjecture. So that's something that we can make sense of, at least in near weak coupling in a non-abelian gauge theory, using this point of view. Uh, we can also make sense of, uh, we can also talk about um, conjectures that have to do with zero form symmetry. So for instance, a famous one is the distance conjecture. Uh, the distance conjecture says that if we move a modulus all the way out to infinity, then there must be a tower of light fields, uh, a tower of fields that come down exponentially fast. And well, the modulus as it moves out towards infinity is developing a shift symmetry. And this shift symmetry being badly broken at the Planck scale is actually equivalent to the, the um, in certain contexts, to the distance conjecture. So that gives another unified point of view on those, uh, uh, on those conjectures. Okay, so I'm almost out of time. Let me just say some uh, questions for discussion. These are completely open. I think it would be interesting to make progress on them. So can we sharpen this idea, th this kind of guess that symmetry is broken uh, by the Planck scale? One thing you might try to do is you can look at um, high energy scattering. High energy scattering in quantum gravity is supposed to be dominated by black holes. And so you could ask, does that assumption, the, the domination of uh, high energy scattering uh, by black holes, does it imply the presence of symmetry violating operators in the effective action? So just very concretely, take a complex scalar. It has an approximate U1 symmetry. If I demand that, um, that can I can I learn that uh, through black hole dom that uh, there's a symmetry violating operator in the Lagrangian, maybe a very irrelevant operator with an order one coefficient in Planck units? And another question you might ask is whether you could try to uh, use entropy arguments to constrain to, to motivate this kind of conjecture. The the original uh, um, 
conjecture, uh, the, the original kind of arguments about uh, uh, about no global symmetries, these have to do with uh, kind of not liking remnants, not liking exactly stable remnants. If we have just an approximate global symmetry, not an exact global symmetry, we'll have very long lived meta uh, remnants, but not exactly stable. But maybe still we can use entropy arguments to say why we don't like them. Okay, so uh, these are just some, um, so, some uh, rough ideas and uh, I'll stop here and we can go to the discussion. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the nice talk. Um, so I was wondering if you have anything to say about, uh, say, Petchy Quinn symmetries. So you mentioned the distance conjecture for a, an infinite distance point. Um, but it was my understanding that Petchy Quinn symmetries can be, say, exponentially suppressed, uh, the amount of symmetry breaking. So, so what would you say about that? You're talking about the axion case, is that? Axion that shift question? symmetry. Yeah. yeah. Um, well. It's a bit tricky because the the axion the the um, the absence of these other kinds of symmetries um, will like this one and um, and, and the uh, one form symmetry say in Maxwell theory. So depending on whether we're doing non-abelian or abelian axions, the, those kind of, that would suggest that by the time you reach the fine scale, the, these gauge theories become strongly coupled in order to avoid. Um, Avoid having uh, higher form symmetry, and I think if they, if they become uh, uh, strongly coupled, then uh, the instanton action is not suppressed. So that that would suggest that um, there's a link between the axion weak gravity conjecture and these other one form uh, type uh, weak gravity conjectures. Now you, you might uh, be asking more technically about um, about say you know symmetries that look like they're violated only by D brains in supergravity. Um, that, that's an example that people commonly quote uh, of the type that you mentioned. But in that context, it's not exactly fair because you're actually in a regime where the string scale is much lower than the Planck scale. And we don't really know what happens at the Planck scale for that symmetry. We only know what happens up to the string scale. And then we have, then the effective field theory is breaking down. So I think we don't actually know in those contexts, whether those symmetries are good at the Planck scale. And this line of reasoning would suggest no, but maybe that's wrong. I see. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. I can't hear the person who's talking. Hi, Clay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, uh, question. Uh, the original weak gravity conjecture came with a number. Namely, the charge to mass ratio was yes. greater than something with a with a particular number. Is yes. there any role for that number in your way of thinking? No, I, I, that's that's definitely a weakness of this point of view. That that number comes from. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Shiraz. There, there's a yeah. This point of view um, is more about parametrics. Um, uh, in part, it's because I don't really have yet a sharp. Maybe there is no sharp way of defining this symmetry breaking scale. Right, I mean, uh, there's no number here, um, so there, there's no principle that I know of that that singles that out. Um, but it's a, it's a, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't, I don't know if there's a number to be extracted from this point of view. Thanks, thanks, Clay. Hi, hey Clay, thank you for the talk. So it's following a little bit Jake's question, but I would like to clarify or understand better. What it means exactly your statement of badly broken for zero form global symmetries. Uh, so when you say that you must have an operator with a coefficient of order one, in terms of the EFT, you don't want to say that there is a polynomially Planck suppressed operator with a coefficient of order one, right? Because there can be exponentially suppressed as well. Or what would be the statement for the, for the EFT? Well, I, I, the, the question I think that was asked about, I mean, I, I think that those examples that are commonly cited uh, having to do with, with D brains and string theory, that's true that there are uh, exponentially suppressed terms there, but that's that's far below the, the string scale where that description makes sense. So once you get, I, I think all, we don't actually know what happens at the strings above the string scale and let alone at the Planck scale. 
So like the action in type 2B, like, I mean. The axion in type 2B. So when you, when you discuss the axion in type 2B, you're talking about like type 2B supergravity usually, um, where uh, you know what's going on below the string scale. But at weak string coupling, the string scale is parametrically below the Planck scale. So the effective field theory that you're using breaks down far below, you get to ask, far below the scale where you could reliably ask this question. So your expectation then is that it has to be broken? Well, I, I don't really know. I mean, I'd have to write down like some string field theory. I don't, I don't know how to pose the question. It's a weakness of this point of view, I agree. But uh, I, I would say that I don't really know how to pose the question once I get to the, the string scale and above. And when you say that you derive the distance conjecture from the shift symmetry, you just mean that, I mean, you mean that you can get the tower or you mean that the field distance should be finite for a given EFT? I mean that you get that the average particle uh, obeys kind of an exponential-like formula. It's very similar to the, the thing that you find here. So... Like with emergence proposal, right? Like it's yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah, this is this is if you like a way of saying that, that's why I was um, citing these guys here. Uh, this is if you like a way of saying that the emergence proposal that they were talking about is really just a statement about symmetry violation, but for different for different symmetries in different contexts. Okay. Thank you. Hi, hi Clay. Um, I wanted to ask about the, um, so you said that you have an argument also um, for, for we gravity for the, in the case of Mabelian theory with some non-invertible symmetry. What is this non-invertible symmetry? Is it just like the fusion of Wilson lines or? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, so, so, so start again with the statement that, um, that uh, U1 gauge theory has say electric uh, one form symmetry. Let's talk about that uh, that situation. Now, imagine you have SUN gauge theory, but at coupling zero. So what you read in textbooks is that, well, that's just uh, you know an independent photon for each direction in the Lie algebra. Now, that's not exactly true, because even at zero coupling, you still do the gauge quotient. Okay. okay. Right? Um, so you don't actually have the operators F mu nu A in the spectrum. They're not in the spectrum even at zero coupling, okay. but gauge invariant combinations of them are in the spectrum. So, so there, you can use that point of view to build uh, something that looks like it wants to be called non-invertible continuous one form symmetry around zero coupling in non-abelian gauge theory. I see, I see, I see, thanks. And, and, and going back to the point of the action in, in uh, the Ramon-Ramon action in, for instance, in, in in 10 dimensions or something which is broken by deep brains, it, there's so much supersymmetry that you could in principle even ask the question at coupling of order one where the string scale at, and Planck scale uh, agree. Like for instance, due to the supersymmetry, you know there's no potential, you could compute like the leading contributions to higher the two operators there. Um, um, you want to, well, maybe. Um, that coupling at order, what a coupling at order one are the, are those exponentials really suppressed? I, I think it's not obvious whether that will help. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, 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 once you say they're coupling at order one, then I th then I think those instantons that you were that you would say that's just order one. Yeah. Those are just order one numbers. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi, Clay. Um, so, if connecting to the last comment you made in the talk, let's say I I look at the dispersion relations, and uh, I. I stick for the imaginary part, the, the black disk for the black hole production. Yeah. So this will immediately give uh, just powers of M Planck for all symmetry breaking. If I say that, you know, I produce black holes no matter what, doesn't matter which particles. For example, if I take a complex scalar, uh, also if I say, okay, I'm starting from M Planck and produce black holes, everything is generated. Uh, so, is this very naive point of view uh, clearly wrong? Maybe it's related to those examples that 
been discussed, but if I just say, okay, in any theory, starting from Planck, I produce black holes with probability one, and so I now plug this statement in the dispersion relations, I will. This is basically what I was trying to suggest in this, okay. in this comment, that, that if you do that, I, I think, and I guess uh, you as the expert are confirming, that you would deduce that there are symmetry violating operators um, with order one coefficients. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if this counter, if there are already clear counter examples to this picture. Or, or no, I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank Clay again.